Welcome once again to the Social Justice Lecture Series sponsored by the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. I am Russ Littlefield, and I am currently serving as president of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. This is the last of a series of talks from invited residents of Lake County in Central Florida, speaking on social justice and environmental issues that deeply affect the residents of our community. But we will be back with a new series in January dedicated primarily to the subject of environment and race. All of our speakers are free to express their opinions, but please know that their opinions are not necessarily the views of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. Unitarian Universalism has a long history for working for social and environmental justice everywhere in the world. And our congregation hopes that these talks have given you a deeper understanding of some of the issues that affect all of us in Lake County and Central Florida. Tonight, we feel fortunate to have with us Cassandra Brown, a former president of the Central Florida American Civil Liberties Union, who will be speaking to us on why is our criminal justice system so unjust. Before we welcome her, however, I want to turn this over to Val Rosado, a member of our UU technical team, who will tell you a little bit about how you can participate in tonight's lecture. Val? Hi, we're glad you could join us tonight. If you have questions that come up for you during the presentation, please type them in the chat box. For those of you new to Zoom, um, somewhere on your screen, there are some controls. They may be at the top, the bottom, or the right side, depending on what kind of device you're using. And you may see the word chat. If you click on that, a box will appear where you can type a question. And uh, when you finish typing, please be sure to press enter. Uh, there's no submit button. Enter is the submit button. And um, at the end of the lecture, we will have someone from the tech team who will read those questions and Cassandra will answer as many as she can. So we hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks, Val. For Unitarian Universalists, it is a tradition to light a chalice before religious services and before important meetings. It is a symbol of our commitment to one another and to our recognition that all people and beings are linked together in an interdependent web of life. It is our goal to create a kinder and more compassionate world. We call this standing on the side of love. Tonight's speaker is, as I've said, Cassandra Brown. Cassandra has committed herself for many years to the aim of building a kinder and more compassionate world. She has degrees in law and public health, and a background that makes her particularly well suited for her stated mission of closing the minority health care gap in the United States and around the globe. She is also committed to fighting immigration injustice, reducing mass incarceration, and instituting police and criminal justice reform. Cassandra recently served as lead for the Lake County Democratic Voter Protection Team and co-founded a grassroots voting initiative called All About the Ballots 2020. It had a stated goal 
of increasing civic engagement in black communities. As president of the Lake County Voices of Reason, she guided the group in filing a sunshine law violation suit that many people believe was instrumental in encouraging Lake County commissioners to vote against the importation of the Confederate General Kirby Smith into the Lake County Historical Museum. We are honored to have her with us tonight speaking on why is our criminal justice system so unjust. Cassandra? Good evening, everyone. I thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. I'm, I'm sure that there are other things that you could have chosen to do and maybe a few places um, that you could have chosen to um, be instead of here. And so I just wanna thank you and you choosing to be here tonight um, does give me hope. So um, the first thing is um, we have all been culturally conditioned to believe certain things. And when I say that it can be as basic as um, girls should wear pink and boys should wear blue. So I have been culturally conditioned to um, believe certain things. So my goal here is tonight to get you all to examine your hearts and your minds on things that you have actually been culturally conditioned to believe. Um, I would also like to address or answer questions that I've heard asked many times after um, instances of police brutality where people say, well, if, if they weren't guilty of something, why are they running? Or people say, um, if they would just comply, you know, everything would be okay and this wouldn't happen to them. So those are some things that I would also like to address. Um, also, I want to um, kind of humanize the victims and I want to bring um, some of the topics that I'll speak on tonight. I want to bring them closer to home. Some of you know me and I have direct um, uh instances in my own life, you know, that have, that have happened and things that I can share with you. So, you know, I will be a little transparent tonight and, you know, give some personal background information as to how these things apply to my own life. And so hopefully for you, that will bring it a little bit closer to home because many of you do know me. Uh, next, I want to uh, try to clarify the term defund the police because a lot of us just kind of freak out when we hear the whole defund the police. And so I do want to have a conversation around that topic. And then finally, before I let you go this evening, my final question to you will be, so now that you have all of this information that I'm going to provide to you, what are you going to do about it? That's going to be the final thing for tonight. So you will um, hopefully want to know more. You will hopefully want to educate yourselves on the issues and um, try to help bring about the change that we're all hoping for. So I'll go ahead and get started. I do have a PowerPoint presentation um, and it's saying that my host sharing disabilities are um, disabled. I thought we got that straightened out before the... It should be okay. So. It should be okay now. Okay. I there turned it off go. because the chime Perfect. was coming through your microphone. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So let's get started. Um, and I want to apologize in advance. It's a little bit lengthy. Um, so some slides will have lots of information and it's good information and it's important information, but you will not have time to try to sit there and read every slide. So don't freak out and say, hey, slow down. I can't see because that's not really my goal here tonight. I will pull out the meat and potatoes that you need and hopefully you will take time after this presentation to uh, further do your own research and further educate yourself. Um, so it's Injustices of America's Criminal Justice System. And we saw the video. So here it says a system cannot fail those it was never 
designed to protect. So that's a very profound uh, statement. So, so let that sink in a little bit. Many studies have proven that America's criminal justice system um, plays a key role in disenfranchisement of black and brown communities. So to put it plainly, Amer the U.S.'s criminal justice system is not just, it's not fair across the board. We're not all treated the same. So if you have those um, thoughts tonight, hopefully you will see that that is definitely not the case. So first I would like to start here with our black and brown children and discuss the school to prison pipeline. And so what that concept is, is a process of criminalizing youth that is carried out by disciplinary policies and practices within schools that put students into contact with law enforcement. So um, Henry, please go ahead and play the first clip. I do have uh, a couple of short clips just to kind of bring home some of the points that I'm gonna discuss. I'll stop screen sharing. Hi, Mom, it's me. I got in trouble again at school today. Hi, this is Miss Jones again. I'm finding your son very disruptive in class, more so than other students. I feel like the teacher doesn't like me. Other kids do bad things, but they don't get in trouble. He's defiant and shows a real lack of respect for any structure or authority. I hate school because the teachers are always mean to me and I don't feel like I'm learning anything. I'm really concerned about his behavior. I'm always getting in trouble for what I didn't do. We're going to have to adopt a zero tolerance policy, young man. School keeps calling my mother and she gets really, really mad at me. What is going on? You'd better explain. I feel like the whole world is just turned up against me. It doesn't like me anymore. Third days I get up and I just decide I'm not going to school. Every you go to the park, like everybody's always telling me I'm not worth anything, so what's the point of trying? I know the cops are watching us, but we just hope we don't get caught. Your son's absences are a problem. They will definitely affect his grade point average. I don't feel safe in my class anymore. Should I assume you're unprepared again today? I would always eventually get picked on by the teacher. He makes examples of me. I feel really single out, and I just try to avoid people because every time I look, somebody's always talking about me, or she's always getting in trouble. I started fighting more because nobody wants to hang out around a troublemaker. The only time I have real friends is when I'm on the block. So that's why I stay. I'm sure you understand we take our discipline policies very seriously here at the school. What are we going to do about your son? Thank you for that, um, Henry. So here, um, I guess what I would like you to kind of think about is who is on the kid side? Did you know notice that the parents were on the kid, the students at school was um, kind of against the kids? So who who is on the kid's side? And what are we doing about finding what are some of the underlying issues or reasons why the kid um, would be acting out or what the teacher thought was being disruptive in class. Um, and maybe to some of you, you don't even see where there was any disruption. So we do see here that um, the school to prison pipeline, the policies and practices that are directly and indirectly pushing students of color out of school and onto a, the pathway to prison. Some of those things are um, harsh discipline policies, overuse of suspension and expulsion, 
um, police, increased police surveillance and prison-like um, environments in school or over-reliance on uh, referrals to law enforcement. So those are some of the things that we see um, that are directly related to school to prison pipeline. So if you notice here, we see um, that the, the white child in the white community benefits from uh, protect and serve. So you see the officer says, hey, Jimmy, how's your mother and father? Um, and he says, great, you know, I'll tell them hello. And it's, you know, he's gone about his day. And so um, in, the, in the black community, he says, are you staying out of trouble, Jamal? So there's no good morning. How are you? How are your parents? We don't see that happening. And so Jamal says, yes, sir. And then it's, what's that you got in your hands? And he says, nothing, sir. And then um, he says, where are you going? You go straight to school. I've got my eyes on you. So it's more of a control and patrol type of um, environment being created in black and brown communities. And the end result of this type of um, policing, the disparate types of policing is over here, we see that they are um, innocent until proven guilty, whereas Jamal is guilty until proven innocent. And so we, we find that happening a lot in the um, communities of color. So uh, an issue that we have there is adultification bias. And this is where our um, students are seen as older than what they really are. We also have issues where um, boys and black, black boys and girls are not given the benefit of innocence as white children are. They feel that our children are responsible for childhood mistakes. And then they'll say, oh, you know, he's just being a kid when it comes to, to white children. And so we do see where instances where they say, um, our girls aren't ladylike enough or, or feminine enough. And so that kind of goes into the whole um, stereotype. Many of us have been conditionally um, made to believe that angry black woman um, type of talk. I'm sure many of you have heard that. I've heard it a lot lately with um, uh, Vice President elect Kamala Harris coming into office. And I've seen comments where on Facebook they say, oh, she was rolling her eyes and, you know, that type of thing. And all of that plays into this, this thoughts of the angry Black woman. And so as you can see here, it starts with our children at, you know, as young as 10 years old, where they're not given that benefit of innocence um, as other children are. And so, um, the other thing here is community policing. So that is where there's a, a culture of familiarity and there's also um, trust being built in our communities. When we hire local cops, we have uh, officers that know our children, that know us, they go to church with us, they go to the same barbershop as we do. And so, you know, there's some familiarity there. And so for me, what I get from that is if there's a situation, the officer won't be as quick to pull out a gun and kill somebody because, hey, I know this kid's grandmother, right? Or if they see this child is going down the wrong path, um, instead of arresting the child, they'll go and have a conversation with someone at home or even have a man-to-man -man conversation with that child. So this is the whole uh, focus of community policing. So Henry, can you go ahead and play the video for this one, please? From Orange County, we are here to do everything that we can to Orlando and even Sanford. Officers are working to build positive relationships with the community. What we're doing is we're building trust. We're having an opportunity to have those conversations. The idea of community policing, however, isn't new. But Sanford Police Chief Cecil Smith says there should be a bigger focus. He inherited the police force at the height of similar calls for change following the death of Trayvon Martin. Chief Smith's new change meant action. One of the things that we require officers to do on a daily basis is get out of their cars, 
and knock on doors, read books to kids, or simply say hello and engage people in the community. His department also recently launched a cadet program with focus on local recruiting. We are hiring officers from the community who look like the community, who speaks like the community, and has a general idea of those things that are uh, taking place in the community. We spoke with several law enforcement agencies about their community policing efforts. The Orange County Sheriff, Orlando Police, and Volusia Sheriff all encourage community policing efforts. Of those we checked with, only Sanford requires it. Since 2015, Sanford PD has held more than 16,000 community outreach initiatives, including community walk and talks, meeting events, and crime prevention and community education sit downs. We're actually having an ability to reduce the crime in the community as well. And the stats back it up. Sanford reporting a high of more than 3,300 crime incidents in 2016, down 20% in 2019. While stats show crime has also seen a decline under the other agencies, Sanford has seen the steepest decline. If I don't see your face, if you're not out there with me doing the good, what makes me trust you? Fritz Voltaire is outreach director for Rescue Mission Outreach of Central Florida. He says having police officers become directly involved in the Sanford community is a game changer. The officers know, hey, I'm being held accountable by my superior, by my, by my chief, um, to make sure that I'm out there and engaging in a community that otherwise I would not be involved in. Oh! Deputies know that from our philosophy here, if they're driving down the road and they see kids playing out in the road, that you know, stop and talk to them, get out of your car. Our officers need to understand that every opportunity to engage a child, engage an adult, a young person, engage an elderly is priceless. Rather than mandate service, if you're listening to your community, you're going to know what needs to be done. Sheriff Mina, Sheriff Chip Wood, and Orlando Police Chief Rallone defend their policies, encouraging community outreach, but stopping short of a requirement. I speak to every single one of our new deputies that are hired here, and I let them know that community engagement is one of my top priorities. The sheriff also says a deputy's community involvement record is taken into account for promotions. In Orlando, Chief Rallone says they don't have the man hours for a mandate. I think because of the number of calls for service, sometimes that is hindered. The ability to reach to the community during positive encounters, during non-law enforcement encounters. And Chief Smith, however, feels it's man hours well spent. If I have an opportunity to change your mind and your perspective on a police officer, and you have an opportunity to change the mind of someone else, and they have an opportunity to change the mind of someone else, what we're doing is we're building trust. Thank you, Henry. Um, so next, uh, after community policing, we want to talk about zero tolerance in school where childhood, normal childhood behaviors are being um, criminalized. And so here we have the re school resource officers that have kind of taken over the schools. Um, the school-based licensed police officers can make arrests and they're sometimes armed. Do school resource officers fuel the school to uh, school to prison pipeline? And the answer is yes, they actually do. Police assigned to school buildings often lack the necessary training um, to be able to deal with adolescent development, racial equity, restorative justice, and strategies for de-escalating situations. So a lot of times it leaves them unequipped to do their jobs without causing harm to our children. So really quickly, these are just a couple of um, collateral consequences of the crime bill that funded having resource officers in the schools. Uh, we see here that there was an increase exacerbated uh, the school to prison pipeline for black children as um, school resource officers are twice as likely to discipline black students compared to white students. Um, as I mentioned before, when issues arise like normal childhood behaviors, I'm sure most of you have been in a fight as a child, whether it was a sibling or a friend and you probably made up the next day. But uh, when those types of issues arise, disagreements with friends that may turn to physical altercations, students are referred to officers rather than counselors. Um, there's recent data that reveal more than 1.5 million students across the nation attended schools that had 
um, SROs, but no counselors. So we see there's a major issue there. And here, I just want to say, um, many of you probably remember recently that the an officer handcuffed and arrested an eight-year-old Black student with special needs after she had a tantrum in the classroom. So those are some of the childhood behaviors that are now being criminalized. Also, um, a few years back, I remember watching this video several times where uh, the student was in her desk and, and they said she refused to give up her cell phone so the officer slammed her in the desk to the ground. And so we see these types of behaviors and there are studies out that um, show that cops who dehumanize Black people tend to use uh, force, excessive force, when they have Black children in custody. And that's because if you don't see them as human, what's going to stop you from treating them um, as such? So here we can see clear dispar um, disparities or uh, disproportionate when it comes to discipline. One in 27 white students, one in 10 Latino students, and one out of eight Black students um, are disciplined. And so this is a little more about zero tolerance and things such as fireworks. I can remember my son found fireworks and, and took them to school, you know, and of course that's something a child would want to share and show friends. And so they wanted to put him in an alternative school because of this. So um, that's kind of something personal that I've been through. So um, we have here a such thing as diversion programs. And so with diversion programs, what they do is give students or children, youth, a chance to um, kind of get back on the right track. They provide them with different services. Um, they get civil citations and this keeps them out of the criminal justice system. But the problem is even these numbers here are for Lake County. I pulled up specific to Lake County. Um, there's disparate treatment there as well. We see that only 29.9% .9 of Blacks are diverted. And these are talking about youth. Um, compared to 49.6 whites and only 18.9 um, Hispanic children. And so we do see that it helps with the rates of recidivism. So another huge problem here in Florida is uh, no, uh, the campaign that I've been a part of and I've been to Tallahassee and lobbied for is no place for a child. And I'm, I'm hopefully most of us here can agree that children do not belong in our adult prisons and federal prisons. And so um, Florida is only one of three states that give prosecutors the sole unappealable dis, um, dis, discretion to prosecute children as adults. And it's called direct filing. So if you can see here in 2011 through 2015, Florida led with um, some of the highest rates for, for that type of thing. And really quick here, we have a, a story. This is a real story. Um, and you can get the uh, links to all of this information afterwards. But the young man named Miguel Rodriguez, he was 15. Him and a couple of friends decided to break into um, a home that they thought was abandoned and they vandalized some property. So, Prior to this, uh, Miguel was a pretty good kid. It says he, he'd never been in trouble. However, this prosecutor with this sole discretion, it's solely up to this prosecutor to decide, they decided to charge him as an adult. And so eventually he accepted a plea bargain. He paid restitution. He was on house arrest. Um, he was sentenced to four years probation. So one evening, Miguel gets home a little bit after um, his, his curfew. And the prosecutor decided to, that was a violation. And so they decided to try him as an adult. And Miguel ended up spending four years in prison for that simple mistake. So these are things that definitely should not be happening um, in our criminal justice system. So uh, um, some solutions to this is that educators and authority figures and also law enforcement should take action by improving their cultural competence um, and also learn how to effectively communicate with our children of color. There should definitely be more social services and less law enforcement in schools. And as I mentioned before, most of the um, officers that are in the schools are not trained to deal with children. So we're pushing for um, authorizing funds to establish a nationwide um, training so this is my family. And as I mentioned, um, 
the, the oldest one on the that's standing behind me, he was the one with the firecrackers. Um, and so my other daughters, this one, she was kind of loud and boisterous. And I can remember being called to the school to for a conference because she was, like I said before, not behaving ladylike or she would be extra loud. And she has a really boisterous, beautiful laugh. And, you know, they were offended by this. And so it kind of reminds me that as a child, I was taught in school that little girls should be seen and not heard. And so those are some of the things that I'm, I'm speaking about when I say we've been culturally conditioned to believe certain things that um, just really don't make sense. And so here we have, um, we're moving to the next part of our lecture, which is the mass incarceration. And um, here we will say that there's a video, but I just want to uh, say a few things before that. Uh, the legacy of violent crime um, enforcement, law enforcement, which is the Crime Bill of 1994, continues to harm communities of color. It is past time for lawmakers to dismantle these harmful policies and enact comprehensive public safety solutions. These solutions should reduce reliance on incarceration, um, prevent unnecessary criminalization, and eliminate the draconian laws that keep millions of Americans um, in prison right now. So I just wanna show a quick clip, Henry, if you're ready, go ahead, please. In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain, and drug dealers were monsters. The sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the U.S. blew up. Today, we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough on crime laws, and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the U.S. prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis, but there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana, they're still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed. Despite a boom in its celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry, most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi-billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. 
Kids at dorms in Colombia with rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared the so-called war in 1971. 45 years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. Thank you for that, um, Henry. And so we do see that race matters. Um, and this is just the starting with uh, several things such as the, the war on drugs and um, other things that contributed to our mass incarceration. So if you look quickly here, um, I won't stay long on these, but this just kind of puts it in black and white for you. Um, I like to see stats. And so here you do see um, some injustices or um, disparate treatments as well. One in three black men versus one in nine um, all men and one in 17 um, white men. And then you also see it here with uh, women. Here you see where he mentioned the two million people um, prison population. And so you can see we're leading, <laughs> which, which absolutely makes no sense. And then here you can see um, black versus white and Hispanic. And there again, you see the, the black is uh, more likely to be in prison. So the next couple of slides I'm gonna try to go through quickly. Um, the war on drugs, we have over policing of communities of color. There's the broken window policy and uh, policing, and there's pretextual stops, disparate sentencing practice, the innocence projects, um, which helps with exonerations for those wrongfully convicted. So here we have the um, war on drugs, and it kind of walks you through how this works and how, uh, how people are affected. So Nixon dramatically increased the size and presence of federal drug control agencies and pushed through measures such as mandatory sentencing and no-knock warrants. And so this no-knock warrants is something that you may have heard recently um, in the media when it comes to Breonna Taylor. So um, because of the Breonna Taylor murder, even Florida has started uh, Breonna's Laws, which is banning no no knock warrants, which is kind of putting Florida in a good light. So we're happy to hear that. Many currently illegal drugs such as marijuana, opium, coca, psychedelics, and others have been used for thousands of years for both medical and spiritual purposes. So then we have to ask ourselves, why are some drugs legal and others are not legal today? And it's not based on any scientific assessment. It's basically, um, has, it basically has everything to do with who is associated with these drugs. And so this timeline gives you a, a, a good view of that. Um, op opium law, anti-opium laws were for Chinese immigrants. Um, Anti-crack and cocaine was for Blacks. And then the marijuana addressed Mexican immigrants. And so today, as the video stated, we now have this above ground marijuana market where they're making millions of dollars and we still have people sitting in prison right now because they sold a little bit of marijuana. So what do we do to correct that system is what should be in our minds. Like how can we um, get these people out of prison now that these people are making so much money? So the other um, thing that I kind of want you to keep in mind is different times, different races, different outcomes, and you'll see that. Here, we're gonna discuss the crack cocaine versus powder, which is the same exact drug. It's the only difference is how you use it. And if we can see here under the law, possession of five grams of crack cocaine, which is considered a black drug, um, incurred the same five-year minimum sentence as 500 grams of powder cocaine. So you can clearly see there how um, it's, it's very um, disproportionate. And, and just kind of to bring you back to a different time, back then, this was in the 90s, there was a lawmaker who said um, that trafficking drug is, drugs is too serious of a crime not to consider some kind of corporal punishment. 
um, when asked if a whipping, because he wanted to bring back the whipping post, and, and he when asked would that be in addition to uh, prison sentences, he said, hell yes, put them in prison and whip them too. I mean, where <laughs> that is insane to me. That that completely blows my mind. And hopefully you all feel the same way when reading something like this. Um, here again, we see the uh, disparities between crack cocaine and um, powder cocaine. So President-elect Biden acknowledges that he drafted the legislation that created the sentencing disparity um, between crack and powder. However, he has been working hard to do something to um, fix that. So I can always respect the person that says, hey, I got it wrong. Let, let's try to work something out or let's try to fix this. So here we're just going a little bit deeper. Um, when it was crack, it was prosecution in prison. Um, now that it's opioids and prescription drugs, it's a we need to see addiction as a chronic disease and not a moral failing is what they're saying now. So back then it was ramshackle houses, trash strewn streets. This is how the crack epidemic was portrayed. And so now we see it in middle class, the, the opioid crisis is taking root in affluent middle classes and um, the language has changed. <laughs> so it's no longer um, Ill illegal drug users uh, are now victims of seemingly new disease called addiction. Many of us know, especially from the black and brown communities that there's nothing new about addiction. So they're not punishing evil, faceless crackheads and super predators with long prison terms, but all of a sudden it is a public health crisis. And so now it's about treating addiction, um, helping family members and neighbors and friends. So we kind of ask ourselves, where was this empathy and compassion when it was the black community and it was the crack epidemic? Now I move forward to uh, discuss the broken window policing, pretextual stops. So this is um, these are factors that contribute to mass incarceration. So here we see that um, broken window policing theory has uh, resulted in what cities say is aggressive over policing of minority communities. And so what happens here is that. Um, I can give you an example. In the neighborhood where I grew up in Ocala, um, there's police that sit around, you know, when the uh, exits of the neighborhood. And I don't know how many of you, every time you leave your house to go to the store or go to work or you're out with your kids, you see police that are sitting, waiting to see something happen. And so here, oftentimes, you may roll through a stop sign or, um, you have a broken tail light or something like that. And that's a reason for them to stop you. And it used to be believed that um, that was a way to stop worse crimes from happening. But we see that that is not the case. Um, also, that led to the uh, murder of Eric Garner because it was a policy. They were, uh, he was selling loose cigarettes on the streets and he ended up dead. So we see what this whole broken window policing can do to uh, minority communities. So the other one here is uh, pretextual stops. And this guy, Mr. Moody, when I interned with an attorney over in uh, Orlando, this is a case that we had. And so um, I remember watching the evidence videos and seeing how he pulled in his yard and he was about to get out and all of a sudden there's cops surrounding and they have their guns drawn. Mind you, he hadn't done anything to make them um, to show um, aggression or any of that. He had just pulled up in his yard. And so after searching for hours and hours because they thought he reached down for something and they were saying they thought he was hiding something or they thought that um, he was reaching for a gun and they never found anything in his car. So those are some things um, that people in black and brown communities have to live through every day. Simple traffic stops that turn deadly. Um, this is the, the Central Park Five. I'm sure you all know the story. And we have a little bit of this type of history right here in Lake County with the Groveland Four. And so here, I just want you to notice how young the, the uh, young men were, 15, um, let me move that 15 and most of them were 15 but they were all underage 
And so they ended up spending um, anywhere from six to 13 years in prison for crimes that they had not committed. And, and what we see there is um, also where they are criminalized because they were just out in the park having a good time. And this is where we see the dehumanization of blacks, the way that these boys were treated. Some of them um, were subjected to police brutality. They were beaten up while in custody um, with the police. So here we just have um, the Crime Act of 1994, and that's kind of like what I've been talking about and what it, what the role that it plays. Um, we had the, it authorized the death penalty for 60 new, new prison sentences. We also um, saw with the three strikes and you're out. And this is an interesting story because just recently he tried to have his case seen before the Supreme Court. So this man had been in trouble um, twice before felonies. So the third time he attempted to steal hedge clippers. And that was the nail in his coffin because he's been in prison for 23 years. That was his third strike. And um, so he was out. And so they're refusing to even review his case. Here um, we have uh, partial penalties for juveniles that came under that 1994 crime bill. Two thirds of Americans who were sentenced to life in prison as juveniles were black. There's been a recent case that um, said it was unconstitutional for, for children to be sentenced to life without parole. So that's a good thing. But now we have to deal with the 2000 children that are, have been sentenced and now some are adults. What do we do with them now that we've come to our senses and changed that? So really quickly here, um, as far as uh, the death penalty, we have more federal, we have had more federal executions in 2020 than in the past 57 years under the Trump administration. And um, that's a, that really should <laughs> like blow your mind because it, it blew my mind. And even though we need these changes, I want you to know that in March, the legislative session ended and Florida adjourned without passing a single criminal justice reform policy. So next we'll talk about the disenfranchisement of black and brown communities really quickly, um, employment, housing, education, jobs. So we, most of us know about Amendment 4. Um, we know that that's still being fought in court. We also um, want to encourage, if you know anyone that needs help with getting their rights restored, there's been millions of dollars donated towards that cause. I've been to Tallahassee to lobby for things such as ban the box. And this is where um, employers can't have that question on the on the application asking um have you ever been convicted of a felon because normally when they see that you check yes because you want to be honest and it goes in the trash so now this gives the opportunity for them to at least um have a conversation with you get to know your skills and this that the other before making that decision Another good thing about Florida recently, credit to DeSantis, he's done a major overhaul of um, the barriers of getting occupational licenses. So things such as becoming a barber, my son just got his license, um, state license to be a barber. And so it used to be if you had felony convictions, you couldn't even get that type of license. So like I said, Florida has had a major overhaul of that kind of thing. And of course, there's barriers because we know some landlords won't even look at an application if they find out that you are a convicted felon. So some other barriers is uh, earnings. We see here that uh, white people um, earn far have the potential to earn far more. Um, I'm apologize more money than um, black people. So there's a huge gap there as far as uh, earnings, and we can see the numbers there. So um, a main issue is that our prison systems used to be about rehabilitation and you could even get uh, Pell Grants and while you were incarcerated. Now it's all about punishment. So that's something else that we uh, could look into. And you have here where um, a senator said that some convicts have figured out that Pell Grants are a great scam. Rob a store, go to jail and get your degree free. 
how many of you are willing to risk your freedom to get a college degree? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so we go to voting rights and we can see here, this is where I want you to look closely, is that Rick Scott only um, restored rights for 27.5% of black people, but 59.7% of uh, whites. So finally, we get to police brutality, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to go through this quickly, and um, defunding the police. Uh, here we have a thing that says, so young man, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he just says, alive. And, and sadly, this is the reality for a lot of minority children. This is just a clip here where um, in May, the New York Times dedicated their whole front page to COVID and somebody came up with the idea, hey, let's do that for the more than 7,000 um, Black deaths uh, by police. So here's just a few more stats. You can see lifetime risk of being killed by police officers. So next, um, before we go here, I just want to um, maybe have a few people put in the chat or something, just what comes to mind when you hear defunding the police. Because I know a lot of us, we kind of completely shut down and it's like, you know, no way, they're crazy. So just kind of what are you, what are your thoughts around defunding the police? Because I, as I told you before, I'm going to come and try to um, give you a better understanding of what that means. And I'm sure we all like ice cream. And I know that defunding the police is, is leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So hopefully seeing Ben and Jerry's ice cream <laughs> kind of makes it a little bit more palatable for you. Um, and, and once I explain it, hopefully you can understand it and you will share what you've learned with your neighbors and friends. So um, yeah, we're, we're almost out of time, my apologies. So as we can see, the budget for policing here is about 115 billion. So if we can just take a little bit of that and put it towards affordable housing or job training or some of these other um, instances, we know the one guy that was just killed, uh, Mr. Pruitt um, was naked in the street and they put the spit thing over, it, over his head and he ended up dying. And so um, mental health counselors, and then we have to think about the parents and the family members that call the cops on their, you know, their loved one seeking help and their, that person ended up dead. Can you imagine having to live with that for the rest of your lives? And so here, um, defunding police only, it doesn't mean we want to get rid of all cops. Of course not. It means that we stop spending our tax dollars on so many discredited, dangerous, racist parts of policing and instead invest in some of these um, other things to keep our community safe. So as you can see here, the budget is about 51% all going to law enforcement. How about we just take a little bit of that and invest in some of these other um, things to keep us safe. So again, about the mental health, we see here uh, a mayor in Boston took three million from the city's police department to um, public health accounts for, and it only accounted for 1% of Boston's police budget. So we're not asking for, you know, the whole thing or get rid of the police. These are just a few things that we would like to see happen. Um, some school districts are cutting ties with police. Um, some actually want to disband the police. Uh, some mayors and governors, politicians pledge to reduce department, police department budgets, spend money on some of those other services. Um, and you have a few other things here, training police. And instead of a cop showing up, pulling out a gun and killing someone that's having a mental breakdown, we send out a person that's trained in um, mental health crises. So finally, I told you the last thing that I was going to say or talk to you about is what are you going to do about it? I've provided you with a lot of um, information and I know it may have been a little bit overwhelming, but we all need to be a part of the change that we want to see. So uh, you see here, I have a few quotes. Uh, my favorite is, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. So once you've heard the information, once you know it, you can't 
feign um, sincere ignorance. You can't say, oh, I don't know, I didn't know. I provided you with information and hopefully you'll go and do the research and learn more about it. Um, here's another one, the dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of us, the living, to do so for them. And these are just a couple ways that you can volunteer and get involved. Um, join us on Capitol Hill up in Tallahassee for Lobby Days. Volunteer with Teen Court. They're always looking for adult volunteers, even teens. They're, they're looking for teens to volunteer. Um, Lake County is one, is one of few counties that you don't have to be a, a, an attorney to be a guardian at Lightham. So we can be effective in, in um, the lives of youth who may be on the wrong track or maybe having family issues at home. Um, we should all be uh, advocating for community policing. Um, and when you're voting, we just had a major thing with voting, you should definitely be voting for people who share your interest or um, are in favor of reform for criminal justice, for the criminal justice system. We should also be advocating or serving on community advisory boards. If you don't have time to do any of these things, we'll take your money. <laughs> so you can definitely donate to um, different orgs that are, are fighting these causes every day and learn the issues, do your research. And the most important thing is to have these conversations with your um, families and with your friends. So I appreciate you very much. I don't know, um, time is up, so I'm not sure how we're going to handle uh, questions. But thank you so much for your time and for your attention. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cassandra, very much uh, for your um, for your presentation. You've given us all something to, to think about um, and to hopefully start acting on. Um, we do have, we probably can take a few minutes for, for some questions. I know that uh, Henry Millett and our tech team have been following the chat and uh, some of the questions I knew that are, I know there have been a number of comments. I don't know if all of those need to be read. Um, you can look at them yourself in the chat, but do we have questions there that um, we want to bring forward? Henry? Well, we do have quite a few comments in the chat box about your question of what do people think about uh, defund the police? What does that mean? And, uh, I'll just highlight a couple of them here. Um, unfortunate that it turned into closing down policing, which really is the intent, I suppose. Uh, take away their guns, use money for more training and counselors. Um, stop militarizing police departments. It sounds like taking money from their budget. And uh, we had another one. Um, I know it means to leave police of dealing with situations they're not qualified to do, but defunding is a bad misleading term. What do you think about that? Is, could we find another term for that or is there any action to do that? You're, you're muted, Cassandra. Term for defunding the police? Yeah, instead of stressing defund the police, is there another way to approach it? Uh, what do you think of that? Because it's, it's, it's um, misleading. Yeah, I know a lot of people just can't stomach that and they, the first thing they think is they're trying to get rid of the police. Um, I guess we, it's more about divesting some of the funding to some of the other services that where they're needed. And like you said, having mental health counselors show up instead of having um, police show up. So for me, once you understand what that term is, I'm hoping you can look past the words and, and kind of discuss with other people what it actually means and dispel some of those negative connotations that come along with hearing, oh, we want to defund the police. Um, I agree. I wish they could have picked another term, but <laughs> they didn't, so it is what it is, but that's not something we should be dwelling on once we know what that actually means. Okay, thank you. That was from Diana K. Reed, by the way, that particular issue. Just to Thank point out, she was going to raise that. Uh, Rest, uh, I'm going to entertain uh, uh, if anyone has a burning question from the gallery, and if my tech team could help me identify anybody that may raise their hand with that. Does anybody have a question that they would like to ask uh, directly to Cassandra? <laughs> no, but I, I, I think I disagree with her. Who is this? 
getting with the, the defunding thing, it's it doesn't mean you can't change the word now for public consumption. Not everybody listens and delves deeply into things and that one word just signals no to a lot of people. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, we've got uh, Greg William Wilhelm raised his hand. Greg? Yeah, this is Greg Wilhelm. Hi, Cassandra. It's good Hi, to see Greg. you. Hi, Greg. Uh, since we can't see anybody in person anymore, this is the next best thing. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you have to deal with in this world, in this environment, is messaging. And it, it reminds me to fund the police is like the death tax. Uh, the death tax, it, 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 it is such a negative connotation uh, where billionaires can pass on their money without any tax consequences is what it boils down to. So I understand what you're saying, Cassandra. I understand that defunding the police means you reinvest in the community uh, and actually investing in people. Uh, but messaging is important. And I wish I had a catchphrase that would be a positive. Uh, I mean, investing in the community is as close as I can get. Um, but somebody smarter than I am it would come up with a way to take a, a minus and turn it into a plus. One of the issues we do have with policing is that uh, we're asking police to do everything and they're not equipped for it, okay? There's no reason why we have police doing traffic stops Okay, proactive traffic stops. That's the first issue. Uh, when we could do that with cameras. Okay, we don't we don't need policemen. Okay, to be able to walk around, you know, running around looking for infractions when we can capture that with it, or even use an auxiliary. Like uh, we don't ask police to do parking violations. All right, well, a lot of the things that they do are in that same category. We just don't do it. All right, so. From that standpoint, uh, we have over a million, the statistic I saw that really, you know, that surprised me, we still have over a million people that are police officers that are involved in policing. We are the most over-policed country in the world, okay? And out of that hundred million, you can't tell me that we don't have a lot of people there that should not be doing this, but we have no nationwide way to even track who these people are and make sure they don't have a license to kill, maim, and destroy property. And with that, I'll get off my soapbox. And thank you again, Cassandra, very much for doing this. Okay? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, uh, Greg, I just want to address one thing that you said. Recently, um, Aramis Ayala came out with the, the Brady list, and that's something she had been pushing for for a long time. And I don't know if you remember when I first came on to LCBOR, there was a push for um, doing research on the officers. You can go to their Facebook, their social media accounts, and you can see some of the racist things that they would be saying. And so uh, what the Brady List does is if you're caught um, fabricating uh, stories while you're testifying or handling cases, your name goes on a list. And so from now on, you're not qualified to testify against someone or, you know, be the reason why someone is being locked up because you have that bias. And so we can't trust you to be honest about um, someone's life, you know. So I think that's a that's a good place to start is the Brady list because you expose some of those people. Yeah, there was the uh, article, we talked about it back then, there were 17... Uh, Here in Lake County, right? Sheriff's deputies that they caught up in that uh, when they were doing an analysis. So, yeah, uh, and uh, we found out when we pressed the issue that what almost all of them, but like they'd all been either they quit or they left or they got fired. Okay, there's mm -hmm. like one or two left on it, which is one of the issues. It's so easy for them to move to another police exactly. department. Exactly, that's another and issue. There's no way to track. Okay, even why they they why they lost their jobs. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's a good start, uh, but it's it's like a minuscule start for the problem mm -hmm. that we have. Okay? Right, we right. Just keep pushing like we always do. We just keep exactly. Right. Cassandra, I think we Jane Hefting. Did you have your hand up earlier? Uh, I, I passed. Go ahead. Oh, you passed. Well, I wanted to point out that Jane was one of the motivators of this program. So. 
Uh, if you happen to see Jane on the uh, uh, screen there, she this whole program for the lecture series, she put a lot of effort and drive and energy into that. So thank you very much, Jane. I did see another hand, uh, uh, Pat Beerholder, is, is I say that right? Yes, you did. <clears throat> um, I'm a former teacher and um, I've always had a concern, although I don't know what the current figures are, about the amount of money that's put into prisons and incarcerating people versus the amount of money that legislators are willing to put into schools. And um, one of my neighbors in Pennsylvania, he ran for school board. And um, what he said was that the money that's put into schools is the best money that is spent because you are not putting it into programs um, after graduation. If you prepare kids, uh, you give them what they need for their 12 years of schooling, then you don't have, you shouldn't have the societal problems that follow. And I, I don't know if that has changed. I've been out of teaching for 15 years. So I don't know if that has changed. I do read and hear about for-profit prisons yeah. And if they build them, they want to fill them. And that concerns me. So Absolutely. Um, so I was actually in a, a juvenile justice committee meeting the other day, and it came up that um, they look at whether or not kids can read, how many kids can't read at the fourth grade level, and they use those stats to build more prisons. And so that's where we came with all of these prisons and more prisons and more prisons. And, and when I spoke about um, rehabilitation versus punishment, that's where the money is going and we're only focused on uh, punishing them. And a lot of times they get ready to leave and the officer says, oh, you'll be back. So we know that they're not training them. They're not preparing them to come out. And then once they come out, there's all of these barriers that keep them from living um, productive lives. And so I'm not even sure what we expect from a person that returns to society. They can't, um, it's hard to get education. They can't um, be with their families who, because of social services. Because if you come home and you want to be with your wife and kids or whatever, and they're receiving any of these social services, you're not allowed back in that home a lot of times because that will cut, cut them off. So there's so many barriers and I just don't understand what we expect from people returning back to society. I think so many of us don't realize the barriers that returning citizens face. We just don't exactly. know. Exactly. Okay. There's one other question here that it's come up in chat and I thought I would raise it. Uh, this is from Patricia Jackson. And uh, it's a little bit different uh, question. Remember that black children are operating out of their cultural environment. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but do you have any thoughts about that, Cassandra, as to what that uh, might be getting at? Absolutely. So for me, it kind of goes back to what I was um, talking about when it came to my daughter. Um, you know, sometimes they see my, like my daughter was loud, and so they weren't used to that because a lot of uh, white children are more quiet. You know, they're not loud. They're not doing certain things or certain behaviors. And so because you're not used to that behavior or you um, are not used to being in that culture, you you make it, you give it a negative um, connotation. You make it seem like something bad because you don't understand it or because it's not something that your child does. And so that's where we want our educators, our law enforcement, to um, be trained and culturally and on these biases so that they can recognize there's something in me that reacts to a child doing something and they say, oh, you have an attitude problem. When no, that's just, you know, that's the way it is in their house. This is the way they behave and it's nothing negative about it. But because you don't understand it, you will paint it in a, or see it as a negative. And so that's where the training comes in to help us to address those biases and learn how to communicate and deal with children of color. Okay, thank you very much, Cassandra. I think that's, oh, Diana Reed has one more issue. Diana, would you like to speak? Uh, unmute yourself. Oh, this is just pie in the sky, but I, <laughs> it's my personal opinion that there ought to be a psychological test for all prospective 
uh, police officers to determine whether or not they have sadistic tendencies, um, or, or actually whether they're there to serve or to control. That's the real dichotomy that you mentioned in, in your uh, uh, slides, Cassandra. And the other thing is there ought to be a, a interstate, therefore a national database of, uh, of police officers who have been um, either uh, dis repeatedly disciplined or discharged so that they are not allowed to go from one place to another to another to perpetrate the same cruelties on citizens in a different location. It's like what it is now. It's like the Catholic Church letting these predatory priests go from place to place to place. Um, and then thirdly, also, with the, um, a lot, I think from what I hear that a lot of the problem with the policing also has to do that they're not, there are a lot of people with mental health problems and they are not equipped to deal with these. Um, and you can't make police, uh, you know, psychologists, but you can give them enough training for gosh sakes that they ought to be able to be able to identify and de-escalate a situation with a mentally ill person. So that's my, <laughs> those are my feelings about all of this. Any comments Absolutely. on that, Cassandra? Um, I agree 100%. And even if um, the police don't have that training, there's enough mental health um, professionals that should be called when these things are happening. They shouldn't be calling the cops. And right now it's a scary situation for uh, black and brown parents to call officers. You have this, your child or family member here acting out and it's like, do I call the police and risk them being killed? Or, you know, do I risk getting beat up or, or whatever is happening? So um, I, I honestly don't believe that the police should be called. I feel like there should be other people who are already trained to handle these situations mm -hmm. and to um, de-escalate the situations. And um, another thing is training for the cops because they're all trained to shoot mid-mask and to mask and to um, kill, to do anything necessary to take down the threat. So you go in there thinking, hey, this is a threat. So somebody's gonna die today. So we definitely need to uh, redo that entire process. And uh, maybe even hearing that President um, elect Biden is saying, why can't they shoot him in the leg or something? And that's a question that we've always asked. Like, why do you have to shoot so many times? And why do you have to kill them? But that's what they are taught. And so we, we need to revamp that entire um, training process. Do you think race is at the bottom of that kind of training that says when you shoot, you need to shoot to take them out? I mean, for some, and like we said, uh, like Diana said, they should have some kind of screenings for when these officers are being um, coming on for employment to kind of pull out some of those biases. So, you know, they have all types of psychology, uh, psychological train um, um, surveys and different things like that. So some of those would reveal these types of biases and automatically that should be a disqualification. But most times you don't even see that kind of survey being offered, you know, and like she said, they can go state to state, you mess up, you have bad behavior over here, you're fired and with a whole laundry list of um, issues that you've had, and then you just go to the next state or right up the road and you're hired again. And that's a very dangerous uh, situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I turn this over to Russ to call it a night, I think it's about time. Cassandra, I'll give you the last word. Is there any last word you wanna say before uh, Russ uh, says good night for us? Um, yeah, just what are you going to do about it? I mean, I've given you tons of information. They're going to share the links. And I feel that we can all take part in um, creating the change that we're looking for. Don't depend on your neighbors or think, oh, they'll take care of it. Or it's a Black problem. Their children are the ones being killed. No, it's all, it's a problem for everybody. And we should all be doing our part to, to change um, the current circumstances. Thank you. Russ? Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Cassandra. And uh, thank you to everyone who attended this talk. I, we have been given 
Uh, we have give, been given a lot to think about, and um, I hope that we have in our minds what kinds of activities we might undertake to um, create a better situation in our, our prisons, especially and in, in our schools. Uh, so I would like once again to extend our congregation's gratitude to Jane Hepting uh, and to the uh, Unitarian Universalist Social Justice and Environment Committee uh, who made all of this possible uh, and to all of our tech team, to uh, Henry uh, Millet and Val Rosado and uh, everyone who, who aided us in mastering the challenges of uh, technology. We are, as I mentioned, planning another series of talks. Uh, so um, look out for that. Perhaps or it should be around mid-January. Until then, I thank you all for coming and uh, let's keep the light of social justice and healthy environment burning. For now, I will extinguish our chalice and say good night. Stay well. Good night, thank you. Bye-bye.